welcome. Uh, um, lovely to be uh, with you. Uh, I'm uh, actually recording this from Nottingham today, so back in my uh, old stomping ground uh, at uh, Pete Ramskill's uh, house. So if you see his name appear, uh, I've not suddenly uh, buried him and uh, took over his, uh, his wife and kids. Um, so uh, my name's Henry Normal, and uh, these are four uh, Zooms uh, that are free uh, and uh, are for the libraries in Manchester and for the Flapjack Press. So I'm interviewing four different poets from uh, uh, Flapjack Press, uh, all Northern, I think, uh, and all brilliant. Uh, that's the main thing. Um, thank you for joining me. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy yourself. We're going to do an hour. Uh, in uh, about half an hour, uh, I'll open up. We've got a chat facility down the side. So I'll open that up and you can ask uh, uh, my guest the uh, any questions uh, that uh, you'd like to uh, have answered. So um, my guest today uh, um, uh, is brilliant. Uh, and uh, uh, it's very hard to describe uh, uh, Janine. It's Janine Booth. It's very hard to describe her in that she's... Um, She's done a lot of everything. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, a writer of poems, but also a writer of all other things, an activist, uh, organizer, um, and many, many things. So, uh, the best thing I can do is introduce her to you, and uh, she can tell you herself. So, please welcome Janine Booth. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. Very nice introduction there. Hi, uh, 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 lovely to see you. Uh, uh, you I too. saw you uh, last because I was over your way in Lewis. Is that where oh, you right. are? Now based. Yes, that's right. You were. Uh, it's, it's been. It's been ten long days since I've last seen Henry, uh, <laughs> when he was our guest poet at Spoken Word Lewis, um, which is Lewis is a is a is is a piece of paradise in um, in East Sussex. It's like living in a postcard. Um, so I moved here about two years ago uh, with my partner and youngest son, and. Um, when it was all locked down then, and when lockdown down I thought, where's the poetry around here? I couldn't find any. So I thought, oh, yeah, that means I'm going to have to set it up, doesn't it? Um, so starting a year ago, uh, every month on the first Sunday from seven till ten at the Royal Oak, we have spoken word Lewis. And, and uh, you, 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 you spell it with the oak in the middle. So it's spoken uh, word. Do, spoken uh, word with a in the middle because we're witty. Yeah, I, I bet I bet that's caused some uh, some kerfuffle. At some yes, point. I have had people point out my spelling error to me <laughs> to explain to them that it was deliberately like that. So last month or this month, earlier this month, the last gig, we celebrated our first birthday. Yeah, that's, and, that's uh, nice. And you know, what's a birthday party without Henry Normal? So. Do you know, it was lovely. Although it, I've got to say, it was like a sauna. It was like a sauna. Yeah, you can't open the windows in there, can you? So no, do people do that. come along, bring your bathing suit. Is all. Yeah. Right. It's going to be cooler next month, though. It is, uh, but, well, I suppose it is. You, you'll be hugging each other. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so it's lovely. But of course, you and I first met uh, um, up north, didn't we? It did in Manchester. In, in Manchester, um, and that were back in the days. Because although you look very youthful, uh, Jean, mm, you, you are very experienced. It's all hair dye. It's, yeah, not very experienced. And, uh, I, I, I do like your backdrop. Yeah, you do look like you're driving a, a, a mobile library there. I do, I do. I mean, it's not a backdrop; it's an actual library. Is it? It is an actual yeah. library, but your actual home library. Yeah, a home library it used to be a garden, a garden, a garage, and yeah. we got it converted into a library. Yeah. So, uh, how long ago was it that you and I first met? Uh, it would have been in the nineteen eighties because we first met in Manchester. Yeah. And I went to university in Manchester in nineteen eighty five. Uh, and and uh, um, back then there was a lot happening poetry wise in terms of it, it changed. yeah ranting poetry yes uh, uh, so you know uh, starting with people like I suppose John Cooper Clark and Attila the stockbroker and Seething Wells and people like that it became a thing to basically jump up at punk gigs in between bands and uh, and rant a lot and. Um, yeah, and and uh, it was quite uh, uh, politically motivated as well. There was uh, absolutely there was a, a, lean um, a bit, a bit like punk rock itself, which said, "Look, if you've got something you want to shout about, you don't even have to be particularly good at music. Yeah. Um, you can form a punk band." And of course, with with ranting poetry, even better, you don't even need to pretend to be any good at music. You yeah. can just stand up and rant about stuff. Yeah. I think one of the things that's quite interesting is oh. that then. Oh, I don't know what that is. That's very weird. Is that you? No, uh, I say it's not my computer, so I didn't touch anything. Uh, uh, ah. 
it'll go away. So uh, um, yeah, the, the, it, great, the great thing about you is is that you um, uh, you've kept the ethos. I think for yeah. for me, you you you're sophisticated and you've done lots of things, but the I'm going to quote you on some of this stuff. You know, you're going to start. Yeah, I know, but, 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 but the, the essence of what I was drawn to. Uh, uh, with um, the uh, the punk movement, but also the, the post punk uh, uh, sort of new wavy movement, the 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 essence of that, I think you've you know in all the the different works that you do, you've, you've kept the, uh, the essence of that, which I think is yeah. Awesome. Well, I mean, the, the interesting thing was I actually stopped doing poetry in the late nineteen eighties, and I didn't do poetry, watch poetry, read poetry, or even think about poetry for twenty five years. Yeah, um, and then I I, I reformed. <laughs> um, I, I reformed in, in in 2014 and I think I think the point at which various people have asked me to explain why I gave up doing poetry and I can't quite put my finger on it but part of it was for me the message was always more important than the medium so when I discovered you know uh ranting through megaphones on demonstrations and doing speeches at conferences and that kind of stuff uh the poetry kind of yeah, exactly. So you and I have both shared that because I I, yeah. I I spent uh, uh, 25 years in the wilderness mm. uh, of uh, television. I, I often mm. think uh, I basically should have topped myself. That would have been a better career move. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, I might, I, 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 I might have read the early stuff then, but uh, no. Now, um, I want you to read a poem, but I know okay. you're going to read me uh, um, uh, some poems with, with very different, uh, uh, from very different places. Uh, yeah. Another thing you and I share is we did a gig uh, um, uh, for a new book that you championed called mm. Neurodiversity, mm. Uh, with verse being again. Uh, I, I deny all rumours that the reason we did that book, Neurodiverse, was just so we could use that title. Yeah, yeah. But clearly there needed to be at some point that was some an anthology yeah, yeah, yeah. of poems by autistic, dyslexic, dyspraxic and otherwise neurologically atypical writers yeah. called Neurodiverse. Now, uh, I will talk a little bit about the book afterwards, but uh, can you do us a poem? That'll be lovely. Yeah, so I'll give you a poem that's uh, that's not in that book, but it is on um, it is on the subject of neurodiversity and in particular it's it's uh it's, this is like um i was about to say it's a bit like a football poem uh, that, but that's only because it's uh, a poem of two halves and the first half is about what it's like living in in as an autistic person in a fairly hostile society the second half kind of imagines a different sort of society where we could uh, not have to do what we have to do so it's called manifesto from behind the mask Make me a mask so that no one can see that the face that I'm wearing is not really me. Get me a glaze to go over my eyes so it looks like I'm looking while I'm melting inside. Fetch me some specs that can read between lines. Fit me antennae that pick up the signs. Lend me a lens that reads unwritten rules. Bless me with patience to help suffer fools. Find me a babelfish trained to translate. The looks and the hints are the traps and the bait. Arm me with ammo so I'm never caught in the crossfire of banter without a retort. Fit me a filter to sift out distraction. Teach me a trick to predict a reaction. Create me a coat like the back of a duck so that nothing will stick when they throw enough muck. Install me a switch that will switch off my thinking. Considering probing, deciphering, linking, at least fit a dimmer or a slow-mo or pause to turn down the volume or close all the doors, give me that gift that they call inhibition. So I know when to hush and reserve my position. Program an app that decodes all the crap. Build me a bridge across the processing gap. Alternatively, make me a world where not every place is buzzing with noise and invading my space. Set up society so you can converse and I can obsess and neither is worse. Where statements are clear and where reasoning sound, where some holes are square because not all pegs are round. Where life on the spectrum is not to be feared, diversity is normal and no one is weird. Ditch the requirement for all to conform. Broaden our meaning of what is the norm. Change the arrangements, compete rather less, cooperate more, reimagine success, where a living's a right, not a gift or a perk, where we're working to live, we're not living to work, where skills are acknowledged and talents are freed from each by ability to each by need. Design a fresh start, where there's room to relax, to think, to create, to heal up the cracks, agree some new rules where we all can control our workplaces, life spaces, world as a whole, a future where fear, hate and bullying stop, a system where people, not profit, come top, 
surely this isn't too much that I ask, but until we achieve it, please make me that mask. Oh, brilliant. Well done. Uh, that, was, that was great. Um, it's interesting, I, I find, uh, um, because I obviously met uh, lots of uh, uh, people uh, on different, uh, uh, say spectrum, I'm not, I'm not even sure spectrum works now, does it? It's uh, more holistic. Well, I, I, I recently read an activist who likes to call it constellation, which I think... Constellation, that, that's a nice way, isn't it? Because because you, you can be, uh, you can have uh, um, whatever uh, um, label you give yourself, you, you can have... Uh, um, uh, sort of attributes on one thing uh, yeah. and another, another. It's like, more like, multi-dimensional than spectrum, and also it's full of stars. So it's full of stars. Hey, that's a good yeah. one. I like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. My like my son uh, um, has very difficult speaking, but he can swim ten lengths, and I can't swim at all. Mm -hmm. So so on on very different uh, um, uh, activities. He's better than me, and then mm -hmm. on other ones, you know, is is uh, um, he has challenges. So, uh, and what I found is, and it's quite interesting talking to you because, uh, and and listen to that poem because uh, even the the neurodiversity thing that that you can't actually just put one label uh, uh, on a group of people because every mm -hmm. single person that I've ever met uh, that you'd call neuro, neuro uh, neurodiverse is individually neurodiverse. So they're, they're you know they're 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 very different from each other. Yeah, yeah. The neurotypicals are like that as well. You know, they're not all. The <laughs> they are. You think are. when you've met one that you yeah. know what they're like. Yeah, but you don't because then you meet another one who turns out to be completely different. Do you know? Do you know it's uh, it's so right, and uh, even even all the gender stereotyping and everything. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to generalize about anything. He says generalizing about mm. anything. Uh, generally, <laughs> I agree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read you a little poem, being the last poem that I've written to my son. Uh, and I like to write a poem to, to my son every now and again. So we've moved to, to a new house in, in Fairlight uh, and he likes to uh, to go on the swing and the swing uh, uh, is um, from a, an, an oak tree. So this is called a, a limb that can support your weight. Majestic is a word made for big trees. Hang in a swing is always an act of faith. Sturdy is a word to look for in a bow. My son likes to sway the seat sideways, rocking the landscape. Swings don't come with instructions, only tradition and knowledge of what others have done in the past. Standing on a swing requires balance and a certain amount of bravery, though it puts you in a better position for landing if something should snap. None of this is of concern today. Johnny is a metronome to a tempo of his own choosing fantastic that's great i used to i used to like lying um front downwards on swings yeah yeah i i, I love the way I, I love the way uh um uh, my son he'll approach something he'll even pick something up in a, a way that i won't pick it up mm -hmm. and i, I love that that he that he, he he makes his own decisions on these things Absolutely. And, uh, and as I say, with swings, he won't don't go backwards or forwards. He goes sideways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and why not? And loves it. Uh, yeah. There's not, there's not a law that he's breaking there, is there? There's no law. Now, as I say, there's so much uh, uh, of you to cram in. Uh, um, so um, uh, now we talked about uh, gigs that you've that, that we've done. You've got some gigs coming up, haven't you? Yeah, I've just been adding them to my calendar uh, today. So if anyone wants to come and find me live then the thing to do is to look at the event the um events calendar on my website my website which i'm sure paul can type into the uh into the chat there is www.janineboo.com um i've got a few local things coming up in and around lewis um actually on worthing on saturday we're doing a um enough is enough gig uh, in support of the fight against cuts in support of the strikes and stuff then i'm doing one in support of refugees next month. I'm doing what about rivers next weekend? Oh, um, yeah, yeah, rivers, yeah. And 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 and, and Janine, you're going international. You're going oh, to yeah, well, I'm going to Scotland, yeah. Uh, uh, international. <laughs> I like going going international. I haven't performed in Paris in July. Oh, um God. but yes, I've I've managed to squeeze five gigs into four days in, in Scotland between the eighth and, and, and the eleventh of November. In, in November, so all those are up on the website. So. All the details up there on the website, yeah. Right, so so uh, now you've got a book from Flapjack that I've read, mm. uh, which is brilliant, called uh, Big J 
versus Big C versus the Big C, Big J versus the Big C. Um, uh, and uh, uh, there's a lot of work gone into this. Uh, and um, uh, obviously it's about cancer uh, and, uh, and your uh, experience. Um, uh, tell people a little bit about it, will you? Well, H Henry, you've known me long enough to remember when I was the Big J, that when I did, um, I do. When I did poetry in the 1980s, that was my stage now. Um, but when I reformed in 2014, I noticed that <laughs> Despite the fact that in the 1980s, everyone had a stupid stage name, it, yeah. these days, everyone performs under their own name. So there you go. Um, then in 2016, just about exactly six years ago, actually, um, I discovered a, it wasn't even a lump, actually, it was a strange indentation in my right breast. And it turned out that I had breast cancer. Um, so me being me, I just made a lot of boob jokes and wrote a blog because um, that's how you get through that kind of thing um so the book is actually it's kind of the blog yeah written into a book so it's, yeah i mean it's it's got it's got uh, all uh, lots of different forms i mean there's mm. there's 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 everything in here, isn't there? It's uh, as you say, it's uh, it's a blog. This but but it's poems and it's like it's uh, journal entries, um, yeah. kind of political rants and analysis. Yeah, um, a couple of dozen poems and a ridiculous number of boob puns. Yeah. And did did you feel at any point that you actually weren't going to get through it? No, no, that's. I don't know why. I mean, the the, the doctor was quite clear at the start. Yeah. They said. Uh, well, I mean, I suppose before I went to the doctor, anything could have happened. Yeah. But when they did the biopsy and they said, it is, it is what it is, it's breast cancer, it's 2.5 centimetre uh, tumour, but it's stage two and it's grade two, and we don't think it's spread to the lymph nodes and we're going to cut it out. Right. Um, but, I mean, obviously there's a lifetime risk of it coming back. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I suppose I was just able to say, look, until the doctors tell me, I'm not going to. I, 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 I love your e even uh, um, uh, thought process uh, of it all. It's very, very practical. Uh, mm. Because you, 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 I think you approach life like that, and you're very, you're very, very. Yeah. Practical. And it, it, it's lovely because because I, I would imagine, uh, um, you know, it, it, it's a huge thing, a huge thing that that uh, you know yeah. when, when you first find out. It is, yeah, uh, but I've got, you know, a good partner and good friends and stuff. I uh, One of the first people I rang was Attila the stockbroker because he just oh. had, he had, he had recently had bladder cancer yeah. and uh, had, had responded in much the same way as me, except in his case, he just made a lot of knob jokes. Yeah, well, well and, and yeah, I, I wasn't was surprised if he didn't bring a camera on. going up sure his bring internal the view jokes. of his bladder, so... <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I had a friend at the time as well who had bowel cancer. Unfortunately, he has died since, but um, he was a poet as well. And I thought, um, Ron Graves was called. I thought maybe me, him and Attila could have, you know. Yeah, there's yeah, a three person there's, act there's together. A band, there's a band there, isn't there? There's a band as we had cancer there. in the three most humorous parts of the body. So Yeah. Now, uh, are you going to do as a poem from that particular book? Yeah, I will. And I mean, there's lots of different types of poems in that book. There are some very silly ones. There are some very short ones. There are some funny ones. There are some there's some formal ones. There's there's some villanelles, believe it or not. Yeah. But I think my favourite of all is this poem I'm going to do now, which is called Telling Time. Um, and I wrote it about a year after just over a year after um, I'd had the surgery to remove the cancer. So it was me kind of reflecting on the state of my body and it references a few other kind of wounds and illnesses I've had down the years as well. So it's called Telling Time. Okay. My body is a timeline with every thick and fine line marking a milestone, time grown, each trapped and fracture captured and preserved, a chapter in each roll and curve. My belly tells in its size and its hide of what's been going on inside, etched on stretch marks like a birch's bark, silvered and faded since they first displayed, dark and light, raw and ripe, like a tiger's stripes. Between the moles are the sealed up keyholes, through some of which a cyst was whipped, through others an ankle healed for which I feel thankful. A line along my cheekbone, no longer a weak bone, fortified with titanium inside, an acrylic eye that doesn't see and doesn't cry. 
excess weight and childbearing hips, bitten nail, nails and hair on my lips, three little dots from the treatment machine, scars along folds that are rarely seen, and the biggest and the best, a story scored across my breast, a similar size but a different shape, a valley in the landscape, a permanent monument, a tough white groove through which the healing hands removed the tumour that was killing me and let me be. And every mark has a tale to tell of getting fixed and getting well, of being loved, of coming back from hell, a tale of off-centre adventure, of trips and falls, of friendship and brawls, of scabby knees from climbing trees. No tattooist needle is needed to write my story on my skin, to fill it in, to join the dots and spots and pores and wrinkles, instead life inks and draws. If, by the age of 50, my body at this stage was still a blank page, I'd know I hadn't lived that life had not yet given me those rips and scratches and snatches of excitement and delight and occasional fright. If nothing changed, no scars remained, nothing ventured, nothing lost, but nothing gained. My body is a timeline. It's mine, my life's storyline. Oh, gorgeous, gorgeous. You know, you do a, a very uh, interesting thing because you've got a definite voice and, and you're, you're very, authentic with you with your voice that you you managed to do full rhymes uh, and uh, uh, and um sort of uh, um a a b uh, a b or a yeah. b, uh, um a, you know um, um c b uh, mm. rhymes um but they never feel uh, uh chimey uh, and, yeah, and, and 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 uh, you, you know when you when yeah. you're writing and you uh -huh. You can worry about that, can't you? You can, you can yeah. And I, but I mean, maybe it's an autistic thing, but I like having rules. <laughs> I like to <laughs> so have rules. So, um, I one of the things that I've discovered in the the second half of my poetry mm -hmm. career is, you know, formal poetry. I wouldn't have been, uh, I wouldn't have known what a sonnet was in the nineteen eighties, let alone been seen yeah. dead writing one. Um, but now I love the old sonnets and villanelles and pantoons and yeah. trial. I, I think so. or never sure. But so long, as long as they don't get in the way, I, I like to do uh, different things. And uh, sometimes I write, you know, uh, um, with a with a structure. Man, there, there was a, a an old poet. I'm not sure whether it was uh, Eliot who said um, that uh, uh, writing blank verse is um, uh, playing tennis with the nets down. And, and I remember in my youth mm. thinking, thinking, yeah, but it's not a middle class game. It's it's about an expression of emotion and an expression of uh, yeah. perception. Uh, um, and so I bought I, I I balked against that, but I can see that sometimes uh, you know uh, having a structure, as you say, uh, I, I think it's harder without, in a way. Like yeah. um, I, I occasionally browse through listings of uh, poetry competitions. Thinking, oh yeah, thinking I might enter some. And I always just go straight past the ones that say any length, any form. <laughs> well, you I have never given that. Give me something that says they've got to be in some really weird, obscure subject. No, this is exactly this, forty-nine lines long. This is interesting, this because I have never uh, uh, judged, and I, I will never judge, and I have never entered, and I will never enter a poetry competition because mm -hmm. I, I, the idea that uh, uh, any two poems, whether you've written them yourself or other people, are in competition, I find weird. Yeah. That's why, I, I mean, I don't like slams. I into one once to, to find out what it was about. And, I've, you know, and it's obviously a big movement amongst the young people, yeah. uh, which is all very good. But I kind of, poetry as competitive sport doesn't... No, it's kind of, weird, isn't it? I, I don't but, really get I mean, that. Look, it, was, it was in the Olympics, you know, uh, um, uh, prior to the 1940s. It was actually in, in the Olympics. Poetry. Bring back poetry to the Olympics. That's weird, isn't it? Weird. I think yeah. you had to do it about was, sport. I, think I do think some thing. poems are better than other poems. Uh, and, yes. uh, if you, uh, if for example, I mean, it's not the same as judging. Uh, no, better is a, a strange word, isn't it? Uh, uh, some are more effective in in, yeah. uh, in personally. Yeah, uh, better is a kind of lazy word, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah, if yeah, you're not saying what about it is better, but if I mean, you mentioned the neurodiverse anthology before. Uh, it was an anthology. We had to edit it. We selected yeah. from over 120 entries. Myself and Paul and yeah. Kate and Rob who were the the four um, editors. So. In that case, we had to pick ones that are yeah. better than others. I've just been discussing today. Or more, more, apt, more apt, maybe. Yeah. I've been discussing today with the editor of Asylum magazine, which is a radical mental health journal, uh, which is based in Manchester. Um, and I'm going to become their new poetry editor. 
All right. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. I mean, I think I, 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 yeah, I agree. Things have to be edited, and and yeah. things have to. And obviously, when you're doing your own stuff, you have to. Uh, you, you have to, and when you're doing on a particular topic like neurodiversity or mental health or something, you have to do that Venn diagram of um, got good content on the subject matter and is a good poem. <laughs> just pick yeah. up in the middle. Yeah. I don't, I'm just uneasy with the idea of uh, poetry. I don't think I could ever uh, like brag and say, uh, "Ooh, uh, uh, please welcome Henry Normal, winner of the such and such." Uh, yeah. uh, oh, it, uh, you know, if, if, that's, yeah. if that's if that's how you define yourself, it's a I bit think, weird. I find. I think the thing is, poetry is an immensely democratic art form yeah. in the sense that everyone can do it. But that is both its its strength and something that's a bit less of a strength. Yeah, so it's, I, it's, I, it's I, a strength I that everyone can do it, but it also means that. Yeah, you know, people. Write I do. Them. I do have a BAFTA, uh, uh, but nobody. You do, had, don't you? Of course you do. No, yeah. nobody, you had never to suffer. nobody had to suffer for yeah. me getting a BAFTA. They just gave me one. There was nobody mm. else in the competition. They just said, "You've done enough. We'll yeah. give you." Now, Henry somebody, Normal me, Award this year goes to Henry. If somebody, if somebody, if somebody gave me a, a prize for poetry uh, and said, you know, "Nobody else is up for this award. I'm just going to give it you," I'd probably mm. accept it. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but I don't want to. I don't want to deprive anybody else of that award. Um, I'm, I'm going to read you a little poem. It's very short because we, we were talking about uh, um, uh, cancer and everything. And uh, uh, I, I broke my arm recently, which is not doesn't compare. But but uh, it uh, it do, it did make me uh, think about my own mortality. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and I lived down in Fairlight, but I lived in Brighton for a while. And um, my brother's ashes uh, are scattered uh, in. Uh, um, uh, near Cookmere Avon, uh, which is just I was on down there the other day. That we're in the South Coast. Art exhibition on at the barn. All oh, right, yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, so it's not far from the barn. Uh, um, his name's David, uh, David mm -hmm. Carroll, if you if you see it. And um, and and this is what I want on my bench because he's got a bench there. And yeah. and on my bench, I want this little poem. So I thought I'd read you the, this. And uh, I'm hoping if I read it enough, people, somebody will put it on a bench. So it's uh, uh, so for when I'm dead. It's called Old Me With Certainty in This Heavenly Chaos. Lead me by the end to where pirates sleep, where air has crossed the sea to find me, where my skin shines and my lungs draw deep and leave all fear and doubt behind me. So there you uh, go. There you go. Not uh, enough to fit on a bench and all. Yeah, I, did, I mean, it, it do not have to be a big bench, a little bench, you know, maybe a seat. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, um, so uh, I say you did you do done lots and lots of different stuff. So um, you've done a lot of stuff that you might call political activism and, and left wing issues. Hey, t tell us a bit about that because uh, you've been quite a few. Yeah, I'm I'm what the anti work brigade call a social justice warrior. I suppose it's just it's my big motivation in life is um, you know we live in a world that could that could be so brilliant. Um, but which capitalism makes so awful, so much inequality, so much oppression. Um, but people but, quite but, but, but you've been quite specific, haven't you, with some of the things? So, so, uh, and that's, uh, you know, as a general outlook, I know that that's brilliant. But t tell us about some of the specific books and, and projects. All oh, right, okay. So, yes, I wrote I wrote a book called Guilty and Proud of It, which is a history of the Public Council Rates Rebellion of 1921. <laughs> now, that is well uh, specific. Yeah. It's very, it's very niche, very niche, yeah. but it's actually really relevant because it's about, you know, what local council, what local councils should do when the government doesn't give them enough funding to deliver services. Yeah. And what they did was defy the law, go to prison and win. And well, they won a much better funding settlement. And in the process of writing that book, I kind of fell in love with one of the councillors in particular who was called Minnie Lansbury. So I went on to write a, uh, a biography of her. Yeah. Um, and what else have I written? Oh, I've I wrote a book about... Uh, private finance on London Underground. I've worked on London Underground for 25 years um, whilst doing this, all this other stuff I do. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, because uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, when we spoke before um, uh, that you'd done some books uh, about uh, um, uh, British Rail or trains. Is, was, that, was that the one? Well, yeah, yeah. It's called Plundering London Underground. Right. Oh, brilliant. Mm. Uh, and I, I don't know why you find all the time to do these things. No, neither do I. No idea. Uh, you, you, you sound very driven, as it were. <laughs> I just, I just, yeah, yeah, that's what a lot of people say, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, so uh, as well as the, the poetry book uh, for um, uh, the Flapjack Press, you've, mm -hmm. you've got some other poetry books, haven't you? That... Yeah, so I mean, I, I didn't I didn't do any books in the 80s, but since I reformed in 2014, I... I love that. Yeah, I, I'm going to keep saying it because you just keep laughing. It's, it's funny. Uh, 
I, I should have referred to splitting up in the late 80s, shouldn't I, really? Um, <laughs> Musical oh, difference, yeah. poetic differences. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, just improving the light. It's getting a bit dark here in the South Downs. I like, I like, I like, the, I like the idea of you reforming and then doing some of the early stuff. Like absolutely. Like so band to yourself. I did, uh, well, actually, I'm even reforming kind of, you know, a bit with some of the bands I used to hang out with in the 80s. So one of these five gigs I'm doing in four days in Scotland yeah. is supporting the Newtown Neurotics in Edinburgh. All right, yeah, all right, and yeah, I'm yeah. really excited about that. That's, that's going to be... Now, I'm, yeah, I'm going to urge you, I'm going to ask uh, anybody that's uh, watching if they've got any questions for you so uh, I'll, I'll give them fair notice so if anybody's got any questions for uh, uh for janine on anything she said so far or anything at all uh, if you type them in the chats uh, and we'll read them out and uh, and you'll answer them um without any holding back anything won't you janine You're, yeah and without any preparation or anything so i can just open my mouth and say anything really couldn't i yeah, well, so so big odd so so uh, if you got any questions if not i'll just keep but we'll just keep talking so um uh, so there's uh, so much you've uh, uh, been involved in and uh, and st are still involved in that uh, as i say it's uh, very difficult to cram it all in um i i'm i am wanting us to make sure we get plenty of poems in though so mm, yeah. uh, what was your next poem so I'm going to do uh, what I think is probably my favourite poem. Yeah. Um, it is a long poem and it's an angry poem um, and it's about the Grenfell Tower fire. <laughs> and I wrote it five years ago, shortly after the Grenfell Tower fire. I felt it's very, I could say it's very angry and the language is very strong. So I wasn't sure whether I should, you know, whether it was appropriate to perform it or not. So the first time I performed it was to a group of people from the... Uh, community at Grenfell and they loved it and I thought well if they're not offended no one else has got the right to be either okay. um, so I did it a few more times and I started doing it again earlier this year around a time of the fifth anniversary uh, to remind people of all the issues involved so um, that, that that almost functioned like a trigger warning didn't it if, if anyone <laughs> if anyone thinks that hey, anybody wants to turn off now yeah if anybody thinks they might be upset by hearing a long angry poem about yeah. the how far this would be a good time to go and make a cup of tea yeah. Right. I, I'm going to have a little drink. Here we drink go. This is stop. called. I don't, I don't look like I'm uh, disinterested. I'm going to have a little drink. One. Excellent. Right. So this is called, with Dickensian title, it's called Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times and the worst of times. And the north of the borough gets the worst because of accidents of birth, because that's just the way it works. And yes, you guessed the south gets the best and the rest of the country only registered that Kensington had a proletariat when it shot the commentariat by electing a Labour MP five nights before a fire on the fourth floor grew faster and further than it was supposed to do and grew from its room and consumed and entombed a tower full of humans. The rich and the powerful were unscorched, untorched, untouched, unburned, unburdened by losing pretty much everything. Until then, most folk thought that Ken Kensington hosted mostly royals and millionaires, not the toilers, but the heirs and your graces in palaces and similar places, and with more money than you could possibly know what to do with. And skeletons. They knew that Kensington had skeletons, skeletons in its museums, skeletons in its graveyards. And now the skeleton of what hundreds of people used to call home calls out the skeletons from the cluttered cupboards of the town hall, stubborn behind a firewall, a smokescreen wiped clean by the dinosaurs of class rule, the boars and the fools who rush and stomp around, crushing lesser life forms into the ground. The rich and the powerful tightened our belts, but not their own and a tower full of people lost their life or their home. The rich don't live in tower blocks or social housing stocks. When they reside in tall buildings, they are called luxury developments with opulent embellishments and panoramic views from the penthouse, not a cheap to rent house, nor a worn and spent house, high flyers in high rises at high prices, high status in high places. They don't live in flats. They live in apartments. They live apart in fire resistant compartments with state of the art smoke alarms. And so they should. They're entitled to a fire escape, a safe space, a comfortable place to live. But so is everyone. And you can be sure that in every apartment on every floor there is a sprinkler system. And that if there is cladding, then it's gilded wrapping with all the trappings, not lined with aluminium, the bare minimum, second best, fail, failed the test, discounted price, discounted advice, discounted concerns about how fast it burns. Skin flint say they're skint. Cheap as chips and about as good for you, off the back of a lorry and onto the walls of the towers in the sky where the common people come to live and die. The rich 
and the powerful get their riches and their power from the labors of the powerful and their neighbors and people like them, like us. The first name dead had fled a war zone. He wanted to go home when the war was done. He was learning skills to help rebuild, but he was killed under enemy fire. People live like this when people die like this, when people live like this, squashed into boxes in tower blocks, put up on the cheap, putting up people, keeping the least possible cost per life lost per square meter or square feet of prime real estate to drain on the rates. People die like this because people are made to live like this by a system that gives only the few, not a civilized living to the likes of you. A system like this run by spiffs for hire who wouldn't piss on you if you were on fire. The rich and the powerful keep their riches and their power while a tower full of humanity, of friendship and of family, of talent and potential of working class folk goes up in smoke. So always the people in the cheap seats. The lower orders, the servants' quarters, the backstairs, the disrepairs, the slum colony travelling through life in economy class, the wage slaves, not the masters, the underclasses. And what of those who run this system? The decision takers, the policy makers, the architects of TMOs and ALMOs and scrapping rate capping and right to buy and, and buy to let and let's get by on whatever we can get. A bed, a roof above your head, a home not fit for habitation, voted down the legislation, closed the fire station. Compassion fakers, quick to forsake us. In Kensington or Westminster, hold the line, then resign. Anything to avoid responsibility, anything to pass the blame. Heads must roll, heads must hang in shame. The rich and the powerful give the victims the body swerve. They've got a nerve. While the powerful get donations from neighbours and from strangers that fill the community centre shelves, given by people a little less unfortunate than themselves. The rich and the powerful close the doors in the faces of you and yours to talk about the powerful and sanitise the cause of death and destitution on 24 floors. That's a very powerful um, poem there, Jimmy. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah. Whew. That that must have took some uh, some writing. Some of the best poems are written as pouring of anger all, out all of the out. head down yeah, your arm yeah. through your pen and onto the page. I think. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, no. I, it's it's uh, you can see the passion there. Mm. Uh, it's like, I I love. Uh, uh poetry with passion that was always my problem with um when i was younger when i was uh, uh, in my uh, uh, teens and my 20s so my problem with the uh, the liverpool poets uh, is i love the liverpool poets but i wanted them to have more passion uh, and and when uh, um, punk came along and when uh, the ranting poets came along it, i was drawn to the passion you know mm -hmm. I, I remember seeing seething wells yeah and and uh, just the uh you know the 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 full pelt uh you know sort of um bare sold uh um you know sort of uh delivery and and uh authenticity yeah. of, of of this is what i believe i i, I love that and i know there's uh, there's lots to be said for artistry and there's a lot to be said for um you know sort of uh you know lots of other aspects of poetry but to me the passion at the heart of it mm -mm. is is one of the things that's mm -mm. drawn me to it i think also something like the grenfell tower fire all right we were also all supposed to be sad but we yeah. weren't supposed to be angry oh yeah, yeah and yeah. we bloody well should be angry yes the people in that community are angry yeah. they're angry at the injustices of it all and and, and should still be angry uh, yeah. um, because because it's not been sorted and and, mm -hmm. uh, and and won't be and then for, uh, something will happen again now i'm going to read you some of the comments down here i mean uh, uh, um uh we've got a comment of brilliant from uh is it veron mcintyre oh. which is great uh, um uh, and uh people were have been uh, uh have been sending uh some other stuff earlier um somebody earlier said they love the uh, constellation they, yeah like, constellation is good uh, um somebody else said they love the cancer poem uh, um and um the uh so now somebody's asked what's the reform of 2014 so this this was it right i started writing poetry in about 1980 three or four something like that um when i still lived in the place where i did most of my growing up although yeah. some people say obviously I haven't done much growing up at all um, but I did most of my growing up in Peterborough 
Um, and I started. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a cultural desert, if you don't. Well, mind. I did I did write a short poem. Uh, I can't remember how it goes, but it, it, was, it was a day then when there was a big failure on the London Northeastern Railway. Yeah. People were tweeting, moaning about being stuck in Peterborough for two hours, and I had to say, well, you know, count yourself lucky. I was stuck there for eleven years. Now, now the, the, the reason I say that is my wife grew up in Peterborough, so oh, right, okay. uh, so uh, I've I've heard lots from her, and uh, and obviously when I first went out with her, I used to go and visit her, and uh, uh, we'd try and find a night out in Peterborough. Yeah, so that's is that how you ended up in Nottingham? <laughs> that's that's how I ended up anywhere else. But Peter, <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. To be honest with you. <laughs> indeed. So I started doing ranting poetry. Uh, yeah. Then my first ranting poetry gig I did was with a, a schoolmate of mine called Darren yeah. in, in the pub opposite Peter United's ground. Um, and I did I did ranting poetry for a, f a few more years, and then I stopped. I stopped in about 1989. And can you remember exactly what it was that made you stop? Um, I think it was the thing. I, part of it was the thing I mentioned earlier that for me, content was always yeah. more important than form. And I I'd, I'd become more politically active then, and yeah. um, discovered student unions and doing speeches and going on demos and stuff like that. Also, a friend of mine, Jean, tells me that she can remember me saying um, that um, I stopped doing poetry because I thought people wouldn't take me seriously as a political woman. If uh, I well, that's going on stage. You see, there, there was a there was an element funny of, poems. Yeah, there's an element of me stopping doing it because I won't be taken seriously in television. Yeah. yeah. So I can I, I can I can understand that. And and uh, and and uh, how how did the reef reformation come yeah, about? Yeah, well, that was interesting. So 25 years, and I, I, I mean, I did quite a lot during that 25 years. I became yeah. the I became the first woman ever to serve a full time, full term on the national executive of the RMT, trade union. Yep. Um, I uh, worked on London Underground. I brought up three kids and yeah, did loads and loads of stuff. And then I, I think it was a combination of probably three things that got me doing it again in 2014. Yeah. One is that I'd just come off the RMT executive, so I had a lot to rant about. Yeah. Um, and I've gone back to a part-time job, so I had a little bit more time. Uh, secondly, uh, around that time, Tim Wells, do you remember doing poetry? Tim Wells in the 80s? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Possibly yeah. more recently as well. Anyway, he got a grant from the Arts Council to, to, to collate information about the ranting poets of the 1980s. So yeah. he interviewed me, and of course that brought back Okay. loads of memories yeah. and thirdly um there was stuff that i wanted to write about and the first poem i wrote um, when i reformed was called her name is reva and it was about uh oscar pistorius murder of reva steenkamp but it was specifically about the fact that the media just kept saying oscar pistorius has killed his girlfriend mm. and very rarely gave her a name yeah very yeah, rarely mentioned yeah, her name yeah. and when they did it was you know his model girlfriend. Yeah. Now I, I hate that when you see things on the news, and uh, they do it obviously when uh, um, when, when they're doing uh, um, stuff abroad. Very, very mm. often they, they never mention the name of people or, or anything. They, they yeah. Well, there's really subtle abroad. things like, like that, that you wouldn't even necessarily notice. Like if you if you studied a selection of newspaper articles, you would find that they are far more likely to mention whether a woman has children or yeah. than a man. So yeah. say they're doing an article about someone or just yeah, a yeah. news report that someone's involved in, they're yeah. much more likely to say mother of three than father of two. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot uh, in the way things are said. I always remember uh, um, two news uh, uh, articles and one said um, there was over 2000 people at this event. And mm -hmm. the other one said uh, there was less than 3000 people at this event. And it was yeah. that, that sort of your choice of words decides yeah, yeah, whether you yeah. think it's a success yeah. or a failure. It's like working from home, isn't it? You know, work, why are we calling it working from home? Why aren't we calling it living in your office? <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, somebody sent uh, uh, a huge, they, they must have spent oh, a lot of time writing this. this. Bloody hell. The only book I've read, not literally, uh, uh, is Autumn, Autism Equality. I wrote that. Oh, there you go. My book, see, I'll write that. Ah, oh, keep me next to me on the desk. Excellent guide to how the workplace should be. Fantastic. Work for 20 years. Working from the Yes, I'm master. Ah, ooh, ah, ooh. 
That is the longest comment I've ever seen. That is. That yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there anything you'd like to, to say to Tracy in reply? I would say I'm, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed the book and that you find it useful. I, I do like to think of it as a weapon against employers. I don't necessarily mean rolling it up and bashing them over the head. Although, mm -hmm. you know, feel free. Um, and do you know what? Your comment has made me think it might be worth writing an update for it about working from home yeah. um, because I think working from home is a double-edged sword I think particularly for disabled workers I think disabled workers a lot of disabled workers really welcome the opportunity to work from home not have to fight their way through the public transport commutes each day um, etc but I also think that employers will use it as an excuse not to make workplaces um, accessible yeah. and so for autistic workers you know there might be some changes that the workplace would need to make you feel more comfortable working in the workplace again rather than at home. For instance, getting rid of the horrible fluorescent lights and putting full spectrum lighting in. Um, but my worry is that employers now, I mean, they generally send out to that anyway, but employers now will go, no, just work from home. Yeah. And now, use I, from I, home I, as a, I, I, I love, uh, uh, I say, your passionate in, uh, uh, writing injustice. And, and I think yeah, that's what it comes down to at the, the end of the day, isn't it? That uh, um, you, you don't like the status quo being uh, intolerance. You, you like there to be uh, some uh, uh, end uh, um, that we're going towards. I think there's a lovely phrase, uh, uh, it was probably Martin Luther King, where he said the, the long arc of history um bends towards um uh tolerance yeah uh, and uh, i i i i believe that until the tories get elected and then it goes yeah, but, it, but it's, a, it's a bloody long arc is all i'll say yeah absolutely so uh, look I, I think that comment is really interesting so um i've just put my email address in the chat because tracy email me okay right. email me let's talk about it some more let's work out what we can do about the situation you're in um, also, be in a trade union. <laughs> you can have difficulties at work. Be in a trade union. Uh, you're um, then... I, 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 I've, um, I've tended in my poetry to not uh, it um, too many uh, what you might call protests head on. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I am motivated by things, but I, I like to try and find a way of making it personal to me. Yeah. Uh, and and so at the moment, uh, um, I, I found uh, um, when I was watching the news, um, th this sort of you get an array of things on the news. Usually, obviously not this mm -hmm. one. Uh, um, and and the positioning of stuff, uh, um, I always find interesting. And th there's a lot of stuff about our difficulties for people to pay electricity and gas bills mm -hmm. and, and um thinking back i was brought up on a council estate and thinking back to that and thinking uh um uh, how central that is to some people's lives it seemed very down the pecking order of of, of the news agenda um mm -hmm. and uh and so as 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 it was um uh very keen to me i've written a little poem which i'd, I'd like to read you i think i, I read it to uh, lewis so you, you, ah you, is this the one about fear has found a about, about the post because uh, yeah. uh, yeah. i, I did show me that that, okay. um, that coming into your house mm. uh, um you feel invaded and mm -hmm. and, uh, and it used to be that, that if I got something through the post, um, I, it, it was a place uh, not of fear. It was a place of, um, uh, you know, uh, possibility. Yeah. Uh, um, but I think for a lot of people now, uh, um, and I count myself in it, uh, it, it's a place of fear. So this is uh, where once the post brought promise. Fear has found a hole. It's oozing through the door. It conceals itself in the envelopes and preys upon the poor. Fear thrives in black and white, but too soon it turns to blood. It's there when you close your eyes where hope itself once stood. Fear turns tears to ice. It lays bare every room. It chills the unborn child in depth within the womb. Fear seeps through the kitchen. It empties out the shells. Fear breeds in the bathroom where people harm themselves. Fear pervades your pillar, invades your breakfast bowl. Fear is there within your dreams. Fear has found a hole. Yeah, absolutely. Oof. 
And I think I think I remember Seamus Heaney was asked about uh, writing uh, um, about the situation in Ireland, uh, and and he said it, it has to it has to come from me, otherwise it it, it, it it you know I can't. He said I can't write somebody else's poem. It, mm -hmm. it has to come through me, mm -hmm. and and then I'll write my version of it. And uh, mm -hmm. I've I've always got that to art that uh, the you know unless you believe it, uh, uh, then uh, you know uh, yeah. So here's a little short example, okay, which also goes back to the thing about how, how long I've been doing this stuff. When I was young and full of rage, I hated Tories to my core, but yeah. now I've reached a gentler age. I hate the fuckers even more. <laughs> uh, now you've done well. You've got uh, you've you've got uh, 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 fifty one minutes before swearing. So there you go. You can always beef it out when you put it on, <laughs> on YouTube. Uh, Oh dear. Uh, so, um, uh, what, what does the what does the future hold for uh, Janine? What, what's your thoughts? Oh, um, ah, fighting the Tories, fighting for socialism. Yeah. Um, pursuing some possibly some academic research in interests. I'm yeah. thinking of applying to do a PhD on uh, on the relationship between the capitalist mode of production and autistic experience. Oh, hey, oh that's uh, that, that'll get you a grant. Yeah, indeed. Um, and yeah, more of the same, more yeah. enjoying living in Lewis. Um, I have to say one of the things that can still surprises me about the countryside is it gets dark much quicker. Yeah, um, I always think of Lewis as being sort of uh, like, like a, a, an old town built by Marks and Spencers. Uh, yeah, it's uh, William Morris said something about it being quite, a, it's, it's quite, a box it's, of delights. It's or quite something. comfortable. You yeah, know, yeah, absolutely. The, the only knife I've, I've got quite when... a funny poem about Lewis that I'll say. Oh, you? Yeah, yeah. Is it short? No. Oh, well, that's a it's called favourite things. It's all oh, right. Well, uh, next, next sound of music poem. Yeah. Next time, I say the only knife crime in uh, in Lewis is somebody buttering a scone the wrong way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, yes. So, uh, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you've, I'm glad you've, uh, you, you've, you've, you're in a place where you can stir it up. No good preaching yeah. to the converted. You might, you no, might no, have to I've got to say, when I when I went to uh, to the gig, it was lovely to see all the different people performing because I, I don't get to see a lot of people performing. Mm -hmm. You know, when I do the, the 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 stage shows. I mean, the reason I'm in um, in Pete Ramskill's house in in uh, Nottingham at the minute, so I'm I'm on my way to Liverpool, mm -hmm. uh, and and I'm uh, doing a, a show in Liverpool tomorrow, and uh, and it's quite can be quite a lonely life, and I'm sure it is for yeah. you sometimes, where where you you're the only one on the show. Uh, and, you, and you do a show so i'm really looking forward to doing a mm -hmm. show uh in uh morecambe in mm -hmm. uh, on saturday because i'm on with oh Lemsen. yeah you're on a star-studded lineup aren't you well, well i'm on with them since constellation a, yeah a people. constellation yeah so i'm yeah. on with them since a bird there's john cooper clark there's uh attila uh there's Lem. um, linton quasi johnson yep. I mean, I, I, it's it's all you know. So apart from yourself, it would be my dream. Uh, you yeah. know, uh, uh, tell, tell them to book me for next year. Well, I, I think that's what I think that's what they're doing. They're, they're, they're saving you <laughs> for the the difficult second album. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so, so it'd be nice. I'm going to spend a couple of days in Morecambe, uh, which is not something I normally say. Uh, no, uh, but uh, you know, uh, so coast to coast, eh? Uh, south okay. coast to, to to this. So I'm looking forward to that. Now, uh, uh, what we got? We got about four minutes. So uh, I want you to do a final poem, uh, and then I need to tell people that we've got two more of these. Uh, and uh, you know, I can't for the life of me think who's on it. Can you remember who's on next Maybe week? Right. Dave Viney, right? Okay, that's good. Thank you very much for that. Uh, um, uh, me puddled old brain. So uh, do uh, do uh, uh, tune in for that. That will that'll be gorgeous, uh, um, and that'll be another hour. And so I say, I've got two more. Um, uh, I think all of them will be available um, at some point as a recording, probably on YouTube uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, from uh, uh, Flapjack Press. So if you've missed any. Uh, um, or you're watching this and you're wondering if the others are up, uh, they'll be there somewhere. So, so do find them out. Uh, so, uh, Janine, uh, thank you ever so much for being my guest. It's been lovely to chat to you and, and, and lovely to, to uh, uh, hear, uh, you know, uh, the poems, uh, mm. which is great, and especially because there's, there's uh, a couple there I've not heard before. Uh, and um, and to, to get a, a glimpse 
of what you've been up to because I know there's there's, there's there's so much more. Um, will you um, lead us out with the, the final poem? I will. So another thing I do quite a lot, which I must give a plug to, is I'm part of a fantastic posse of poets called Poets on the Picket Line. Yeah. And we do what it says on the tin. OK, we go to picket lines and we do poetry. Usually this is quite alarming for the pickets, but they usually we win them round. But we also do things like benefit gigs, raise money for uh, strike funds we brought out an anthology uh, a few uh, years ago etc so this is the one that I pretty much always open with on, on a new picket all right now Janine I've, I've got to I, I should thank everybody for watching yeah I take it for granted it's, 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 it's dreadful of me so thank you uh, thank you everybody for for watching uh, whether you're watching live or uh, you know if you're watching this later on thanks for watching uh, I know you've enjoyed it uh, um, and uh, thanks for being with us uh, Janine so, yeah, so um, as I mentioned, I've, I work on London Underground, which of course means I go on strike a lot. Um, and we're in the national wave of strikes now, which is very exciting because they are national railway counterparts also in the RMT are striking it now as well. And the CWU and all sorts. The working class is fighting back. It's brilliant. Anyway, uh, this poem, uh, most people think there are um, 10 commandments. Uh, but those of us in active in the trade union movement know that they're in fact 11 and this is called the 11th commandment i'd rather go to prison or be given a huge fine or have cosmetic surgery from dr frankenstein sit through a boring lecture on interior design yes i'd rather do most anything than cross a picket line i'd rather scratch my itches with a prickly porcupine or spend the night in darkest woods when evil stars align de-skin my legs with sandpaper and wade through lakes of brine. Yes, I'd rather drown in vats of rats than cross a picket line. I'd rather drink a cocktail made of sweat and turpentine or live beneath a spiky hedge in Lower Liechtenstein, lie face down in the middle of an open cast coal mine. Yes, I'd rather eat stale camel's feet than cross a picket line. I'd rather be like Tarzan and go swinging from a vine or jump off that big bridge and then go swimming in the Tyne, bathe naked with piranhas in the high park serpentine yes i'd rather lose my other eye than cross a picket line i'd rather rub a massive turd and try to make it shine <laughs> or roll some poo in super glue and stick it to my spine invest my lot in enron stock and watch it sharp decline yes i'd rather go to hell and back than cross a picket line i'd rather face the rising storm of 1939 or have my photo taken standing by a turn right sign Pretend to have the time of day for Michael Hessel time. Yes, I'd rather have my nails pulled out than cross a picket line. I'd rather make a solemn pledge to never drink more wine or place my genitalia in the mouth of a dead swine, become a shadow minister, then naff off and resign. Yes, I'd rather scrape the barrel's ass than cross a picket line. I'd rather turn my bedroom into a Justin Bieber shrine <laughs> or use an off-peak travel card at 25 past nine send ian duncan smith a secret scented valentine but i'd never no not ever ever cross a picket line thank you